We're here today uh, as for the very first of the Glass Tire Talks. We organized this programming for the Texas Contemporary Art Fair. We are a publication here uh, based in Houston. We cover the whole state of Texas. And um, our speaker today is someone very special who we're very, very excited to welcome to Houston. Hugh Forrest. Hugh Forrest uh, serves as the director of South by Southwest Interactive in Austin. When the Texas Contemporary Art Fair asked us to put together some programming for them, I said, look, we're not going to do the usual art fair stuff about how to buy art. That's the programming that you see at every art fair. We've all seen it. Let's do something interesting and let's do something different. And they were like, okay. So we started thinking about who could we bring that would be uh, not uh, somebody who you would normally see at, a, at an art fair. And we looked around the state of Texas at uh, interesting people in South by Southwest is pretty much one of the most interesting things that's been happening in Texas for a long time now, and especially the interactive program there. Hugh uh, is the director of South by Southwest Interactive. He's been there since the very beginning. It's 25 years old now, which a lot of people don't realize how old it is. Uh, they welcome over 30,000 people every year to Austin. It's bigger than the South by Southwest music or film festivals now. It's the whole deal. And so uh, he's going to tell us some stories about South by Southwest and um, the history of that festival and some of the good juicy stories about people they have welcomed there to speak over the past couple of years. And so with that, I want to thank you for coming to Houston and welcome you to the stage. Hugh Forrest. So, what exactly is South by Southwest Week and South by Southwest Interactive? How many, first of all, how many people here have been to South by Southwest before? All right. So you guys know what it is and you can probably tell me better. It occurs every March in Austin, typically the second or third week. It coincides with spring break. For the interactive event, we have more than 800 panels and presentations covering all aspects of things that are interesting to this digital creative community. We have a trade show, we have a gaming expo, we have a job fair. We have lots and lots of networking and lots of fun. I like to say that we are a living, breathing manifestation of the internet. That means that at any given time, there are 15 panels going on, there are 15 presentations, there are all sorts of parties, there's always something else you can do. The fact that there's sensory overload is one of the top features of the event. The fact that there's sensory overload is always one of the weaknesses of the event too because you always want to do something else and you never can quite enjoy what you're doing. In our best days, South by Southwest is a preview of the future, whether that's on the interactive end where you're, where you're meeting an app developer who's creating something incredible new that will be hot in two years, whether that's on the music end where you're seeing a new band that will be on the airwaves in a couple of years, whether it's on the film end where you're meeting a filmmaker or seeing a new film and the filmmaker will go on uh, and do something great. The three main pillars of our event are innovation, inspiration, and again, creativity. As I mentioned before, I can go on and on and on and talk about what South by Southwest is. It's always easier to show the video. And here we go, technical gods willing. <laughs> really wanted to do something that was in the spirit of what South by Southwest has always been about. Creating a real connection between the fans and the artists and the musical experience. The solution is to change the system, and changing the system is so much what South By is about, bringing people together, smart people, thoughtful people, people who want to instigate change, people who stand for change.
I mean, this is one of the best festivals in the States. When I tell people that we're going to South by Southwest to see it, they say, perfect. That's the perfect place to bring it. And now, Rainey will ask me all the important questions all about art buying, right? All about art buying, yeah. Yeah, how is the South by Southwest corporate collection coming along? <laughs> Pass. <laughs> um, we had a, a nice conversation talking about kind of the history of South by Southwest in the early days. And I was hoping you could speak a little bit to the development of the audience and the engagement with the audience and how that has evolved over the years, particularly most recently with the panel picker process that y'all have. Well, uh, South by Southwest Interactive launched in 1994. This was an offshoot of music which launched in 1987. Uh, in 1994, we launched this event which was called Film and Multimedia. It was mainly a film event. There was one track that was, <coughs> excuse me, multimedia. In 1994, what was cutting edge multimedia was CD-ROMs. Um, so we were very focused on CD-ROMs. Lo and behold, this thing called the interwebs came along and we kind of shifted that and we sh shifted the name to interactive. That said, our first 10 years, we were very small. We, we really didn't know what we were doing. We may not know what we're doing now, but we really didn't know then. Um, we would not have survived uh, these very lean years if there wasn't a South by Southwest music, which was essentially paying the bills on the thing. Uh, we started to see some growth in 2004 and uh, have been very lucky to be on a 10-year growth cycle since then. Um, lots of reasons for that growth. I always say that two of the most important reasons were, were and are social media and uh, startups. Social media, uh, one, in the sense that this, it was this new, new trend that was developing, two, in the sense that People were using social media to talk to their, or tell their friends about the event and marketing it for us. Startups, and that we were lucky enough to just catch this startup wave that has really swept a lot of the country and a lot of the world. And particularly when you talk about social media and startups, we were very lucky that Twitter didn't launch at South by Southwest 2007, but they had their first big push at the 2007 event, and they are. Uh, often kind enough to credit us for being the place they launched and we're not going to dissuade that too much. But another big factor in our growth was uh, this South by Southwest panel picker app that we launched in 2007. And um, this, was, uh, this was and is this way to engage our community by letting the community uh, contribute and be very significantly involved in uh, the programming aspect of the event. So it's an online interface where anyone uh, can, can enter a panel idea, a speaking idea, a presentation idea. All the ideas that are received are then posted online and anyone in the community can vote on these ideas. And the ideas that get the most votes um, often get into the event. I say often because we also have an advisory board that reviews these and staff also reviews these. So there's kind of a checks and balances system. The panel picker is good for a lot of different reasons. But again, if you distill it down to, its, to the, the, the very base of what it does, it's, it's a way for us to create engagement with our audience. Uh, people who are engaged enough or committed enough to put together a panel idea, these are people who may want to register, may end up being registrants. So again, it's been a great way for us to communicate with our audience. You all have had some um, great panels over the years. You spoke about CD-ROMs, and I know there was a panel in 95 all about CD-ROMs, or how to surf the net. Let's all surf the net together. Um, but then there have been some really visionary things that were ahead of their time, like in 97, I think you had a panel, Anarchy, which was about 
it wasn't about social media per se, but about the influence of the internet on political events. And of course, now we've seen that come to pass. And so I think there have been moments where South by Southwest was really, or, or speakers at South by Southwest Interactive were you know, predicting the future of what was going to happen before it did. Uh, yes, we've been fortunate, on, on, uh, fortunate enough for that to happen on, on many occasions. And I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that you don't think that uh, teaching people how to surf the web in 1995 was completely visionary. I thought that was one of our most visionary <laughs> sessions. Well, at least how to, or uh, what, were they, what were they called, the, the groups, the, before there was the websites, the, the terrible, terrible, never mind. It was. Yeah. But it, it is interesting in that, I mean, I remember in 95, uh, that we had seminars on simply how to log onto the web. And that seems so basic now, you know, that like everyone can log onto the web. My four year old can log onto the web. But at that point, people really didn't understand it. And that was a standing room only type session where people were, were simply learning what this web thing is about. It's and easy to forget how far we've come and how far absolutely. you guys have come in promoting that. Um, so we talked about some of the um, speakers that you all have had over the years. Can you talk about, I think it was 2007, the same year you promoted or you launched the panel picker when Mark Zuckerberg came. Was that 2007? Uh, that was 2009, I believe, 2009. with Zuckerberg. And that was, um, it was, you know, I had read this, I'd, I'd read a story in the New Yorker about Zuckerberg and Facebook and I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. We've got to get this guy involved. And I sent a number of blind emails to Facebook and, and um, finally got a response. Uh, and and we, all the, the dots aligned, um, we were able to get him to the event. Now, that's the good part. The bad part is that the keynote itself was a complete disaster. Um, we didn't do a good enough job of preparing him. We didn't do a good enough job of preparing the moderator and um, it just was not a very compelling talk. Well, and, and can you speak to the role of Twitter? Yeah, well, in all the talk? more interesting here was that um, it was an example of what happens with a connected audience, and in 2009, that was a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, you know, in previous years, if you'd gone to a keynote or gone to a presentation or gone to hear Hugh Forrest talk at 11.30 in the morning, you go, God, this is boring as hell. But uh, you know, maybe it's just me, and maybe I had you know, too big a breakfast or too big a lunch, and I'm just drowsy. Uh, with, with this new social media, such as Twitter, and there were various other apps at that point that were evolving, people in the audience could communicate with each other. So they were communicating, this is really bad. Yes, this is really bad. This is really bad. And about halfway through the session, um, a large number of the audience got up and left. Um, the interviewer then made the, 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 the worst mistake possible to say, what you think my job is easy? And people walking out of the auditorium turned around and said, yes, it should be, as they left. So I think somebody was, yelled, stop with the softball questions. Yeah, Ask that was, guy about privacy on Facebook. It was, a, it was not a good, um, not a particularly good session. Um, what was interesting about that is one person I read who was in the audience said that all of the like heckling as it was on Twitter was silent. So there's a conversation happening on stage with Mark Zuckerberg and there's this whole other yeah. terrible undercurrent of discussion. Well, and, and you know, various explanations and analysis of what was wrong with this or what went wrong. Um, the interviews came off perhaps as soft, the, the questions in the interview came, came off as softball-ish. Uh, it also came off, the interview came off to some as catty and flirty. There was also this undercurrent that there were all these social media pioneers in the audience, um, but that Facebook was kind of this, this app that was trying to change the direction of social media. So there was this built-in kind of resentment on that, um, so suffice it to say, it was a perfect storm of uh, <laughs> problems, and um, it, uh, you know, on the one hand, it got us a lot of publicity, it, but it is not necessarily the kind of publicity that you would like to have for an event. So that was that left a sour taste in everybody's mouth that day. But then the next day, 
Can you talk about Frank Warren? Yeah, we talking? the the Mark Zuckerberg keynote was on um, Monday, um, and Tuesday, which is our last day of the event, we had a gentleman named Frank Warren as the keynote. Frank Warren does this website called Post Secret. If you're not familiar with it, it's a site where people can uh, send in a postcard, send in a, a letter that confesses their secrets. And these secrets are then, and these postcards are then posted online. And Frank's whole idea, concept, is that our secrets are what hold us back. And when we liberate those secrets, we are freer to go on and be more happy and, and whatnot. Uh, Frank does an incredible presentation. It's generally the same presentation everywhere he goes, but it's an incredible presentation. And by the, halfway through the presentation, virtually everyone in the audience has a tear in their eye. Um, and so it was this great kind of way that on Monday we had this vision of community that was just completely scattered and, and everyone hated uh, Zuckerberg. And on Tuesday, Frank Warren pulled it all back in and um, and really you know, kind of resolved all that, all those uh, fragments that were there on Monday. If we had planned this as such, it would have been brilliant where you kind of have this dramatic arc and on Monday there's this uh, unrest, on Tuesday it's all resolved. We didn't plan it that way, it just happened that way. What was even more phenomenal about the Frank Warren keynote was the, uh, he had an hour long time slot, he talked for 45 minutes, we had 15 minutes for questions. The first person on stage for the Q&A uh, portion of the event was a young man who asked his girlfriend to marry him. Um, and so how cool is that? I always say that's one of the coolest moments I've ever seen at South by Southwest, that you're involved with this event that people have such a connection to, are so excited about that they're going to, you know, Aww. ask their girlfriend to marry him. <laughs> that and sporting events, right? Yeah, yeah. If you buy a, you know, pro football team, you might have that feeling more often. Um, and of course, Frank Warren's post secret is not online anymore, and that's not the same thing that we've been hearing about more recently, the secret app. There's a secret app that uh, is, does a lot of the same things that post secret does. Um, they've had a lot of negative publicity recently. Um, I think the, the interesting thing there is how careful, carefully cultivated uh, Frank Warren's community is and how, how much attention he's paid to this issue of suicide. and, and Unfortunately, the, the people who did the secret app have not done the same and have suffered, uh, unfortunately, as a result. Yeah. So um, you guys have been around for 25 years, and at one point you said South by Southwest Interactive felt like a band that had been playing you know, in obscurity for 15 years, and all of a sudden you had a big hit, and then everyone's like, oh, the new band that's out. So you, you all really hung in there through some early years, and now you've had amazing success over the past couple of years. Can you talk a little bit about that arc from the early days to like right now and then some of the stuff y'all are dealing with now with being as successful as you are? Well, again, the first 10 years were very slow and very hard to grow, very hard to gain traction. Um, and, you know, pressing as many different buttons, doing as many different things as you're trying to do and just we can't get people to coming in the door, I can't get people to buy badges. I remember, you know, I would always complain to, to my friends, my colleagues, Mike Shea in the back that, you know, hey, we've got rock stars coming to South by Southwest for music. We've got movie stars coming in for film and, and all we've got is these geeks, you know, coming for interactive and no one cares about the geeks. We can't even get publicity within our own company because no one cares about the geeks. Um, what Until I think, they saw dollar signs <laughs> in their eyes. Well, I think that we've been the beneficiary in many ways of this whole change in the culture over the last 10 or 15 years where being a geek has become cool. Um, and this, you know, uh, we talk about Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, so many kids, so many students uh, have seen what he's done in dropping out of school and going to start uh, Facebook and becoming a billionaire. And that's become this very influential narrative. You think about, uh, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg got married, it's covered in people. When Steve Jobs dies, it's like John Lennon dying. When, you know, one of the most popular shows on TV now is Shark Tank, which is pitching your startup to a bunch of VCs. So again, being a oh, geek- There's not a shark in Shark Tank? <laughs> oh, it's not for a shark week? Never mind. Being a geek has become 
very cool, and that's helped us a lot um, in our growth. Uh, again, when we started growing in 2004 and 2005, um, there was this, this uh, issue where lots of people um, would say, oh, you just started last year or something, and you kind of just chuckle and say, well, we've been around for a little while. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's interesting about South by Southwest is the attendee base changes a lot. Um, uh, there's some negative things about that, but there are also some good things, and, and that's a, a lot where this, you know, you just started yesterday idea came from. Yeah, I mean, you all now have over 30,000 people coming to just South by Southwest Interactive every March, and I think in the leanest years of the festival, you had like 3,000, so tenfold increase in your audience size. And I was telling you about how people in Houston will always say like, I love Austin, but I will not go during South by Southwest because I am just not going to deal with the traffic and the difficulty of getting around town. How is it working with um, sort of bursting at the seams in Austin um, or not working with bursting at the seams in Austin during the festival? And what, what are you all dealing with in terms of the success that you're having now? Well, I think that... Uh you know, it was frustrating when we were smaller and we weren't growing. Um, but in retrospect, those were the good old days. Uh, now when you're bigger and, and uh, the challenges become even more difficult. Um, I also think that, <clears throat> I mean, uh, you know, we're all from Texas and we like to be big and we like to be bigger. Uh, but the more I'm involved with South by Southwest, the more I understand that, that size really shouldn't matter that much. I mean, what you're trying to do at any event, any conference, um, whether it's, it's what we're, what's happening here this weekend or what's happening in March in Austin, is provide a platform where people can have meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversations and interactions. And often that can happen in a much smaller venue than a large venue. In terms of where we are now in 2014 and 2015, we've, we've uh, very much... Um, you know, pushing at the limits of what the city can accommodate in terms of uh, visitors, in terms of lodging, in terms of transportation. I often say that um, the challenges that we have at South by Southwest very much mirror the challenges of the city of Austin. Um, for those of you who are unaware, we like to say in Austin, or and various studies say it's true, so it must be true that 100 people are moving to Austin every single day. Um, that's great, but where do these people, where do these people live? You've created, you've created this city, or helped create this city that so many people uh, find very attractive and want to move to. Um, where do the people go to? That's the, somewhat the same thing with South by Southwest. Is we've created this event that's very compelling. Um, now we don't necessarily have uh, places to put them, uh, so a lot of the same challenges there. Yeah. So you will, can you speak just a little bit to the expansion that y'all are doing in Vegas? And that project, V2V? We started an event in Las Vegas in July of 2013. Um, so this past July was our second year. This is called South by Southwest V2V. Um, it is, at this point, much, 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 much smaller than what we do in March, but certainly has a lot of room to grow. The V2V um, event is very focused on startups, which, again, has been one of our most popular, most popular aspects of the Austin programming and uh, uh, the V2V event uh, is, I think, one of the great reasons to be in Las Vegas at this point is that uh, Las Vegas is home to the Downtown Project, which is this thing that Tony Shea is doing. Tony Shea is the CEO of Zappos, and he's trying to remake the downtown area of Las Vegas into this uh, center for creativity, bringing lots of entrepreneurs and startups into the area trying to, to refurbish that area. So I think it's a good kind of anchor for our long-term growth there. And certainly the hope for Las Vegas is that long-term we can push some of the growth from Austin um, to uh, Las Vegas in the summer. So one of the things people talk a lot about in the art world and frankly wring their hands about a lot is the pernicious influence of money in the art world. And I think I was speaking to you about the Jay-Z video that with... <laughs> That, which you all, I'm sure, all know about uh, from Pace Gallery and, um, and what's happening in the art market, what's happening with prices and the auction houses. And you guys see this as well as you have grown so much and in, ter in terms of your sponsorship. 
how are you managing like dealing with having these large corporate sponsors who are extremely visible there and still cultivating this sort of like tech uh, you know geek sort of you know scruffy entrepreneurial vibe that's always been a heart of the festival how, how's that going for you yes <laughs> um, well we've been very fortunate in the last decade and, and a little other than that to gain more and more sponsors um, sponsors are great sponsors help pay my salary they help hire they help pay salary so I can hire more people onto our team um, and sponsors enable a lot of things sponsors also just complicate things a lot more just make the the whole piece a little more difficult um, we certainly have a degree of feedback, blowback, however you want to phrase that from our audience, that they're sometimes irritated um, or sometimes uh, not so enthusiastic about the amount of sponsors that are involved in the event. Um, but the fact of the matter is that these brands are what are, are the people who have the money at this point. Um, and the brands are what create jobs and opportunities um, for the people who come to the event. And that does create a degree of tension. Uh, again, my firm belief is that you're trying to, to create a platform where people can make career enhancing connections and the brands are at this point in our evolution are a, a vital part of that platform. Um, we were talking about uh, how South by Southwest probably couldn't have survived and thrived the way it has um, in a city other than Austin, that Austin's, you know, so special, obviously coming out of the music industry and those, you know, the roots of the festival, um, and that something like this probably would never have made it in Houston <laughs> where there's not as much tech to speak of. But now as you all, as tech, first of all, stops becoming something niche and is in every industry, do you see um, more and more, or do you envision more and more um, uh, maybe panels or sort of programming around industries l like what we have in Houston, the main ones of course being energy and, and medicine, and are, do you see like growing in different directions in that way? Well, one of the benefits of having so much programming at South by Southwest Interactive, and by so much I mean 600, 700, 800 sessions, is that we can do lots and lots of different kinds of things um, and can kind of see how, uh, how the audience responds to various different things and potentially grow those into other, uh, grow those more. Um, when I say programming on lots and lots of different things, we'll cover everything from uh, open source and government to med tech to uh, business and entrepreneurism to social media. We've got a food track now. We do sports. We do lots and lots of different things that are geared towards um, this digital creative audience. Um, <clears throat> we've done in the past uh, some programming that, that is focused on these topics that, uh, as you mentioned, are, are hot in Houston. Uh, some some stuff on Houston is hot. <laughs> some stuff on sustainability. Some stuff on energy. We've now, uh, in fact, pushed that to its own event, which is South by Southwest Eco, which happens in the fall. Uh, in terms of bio and med tech, um, Austin really wants to be a lot like Houston in the future. If you're not aware, Austin uh, UT University of Texas is launching a medical school. First class comes in fall of 2016. Austin is also trying to create an innovation zone which will attract um, bio, biotech, bioscience, medtech type businesses and that will be directly adjacent to the medical school. So Austin would like to become a little more like Houston in that regard and I think that our programming will uh, in future years reflect that more in the sense that we'll do more this biotech, biomed, biohealth stuff. Mm -hmm. and would that ever spin off on something like the eco or who knows? Who knows? Uh, it, it has, I think it has a ton of possibility. Our, our most um, successful event, a new event at this point, is South by Southwest EDU, um, which is focused on the education market. If you think about the two biggest markets that are ripe for disruption, which is this big wor wor word in the startup world, it's education and health. So health, 
maybe something there long term in terms of a spin off event. I would say short term, we are pretty full on bandwidth and probably don't have a whole lot of uh, room to expand uh, in the short term. I think another industry that could stand for some disruption would be the art. Uh, the art market, I and mean, you said geeks love an entrenched industry, and that's the art world. And this is when we transition into how to buy art. <laughs> how to buy art? There, there, I mean, there are tech companies trying to crack that nut of selling art using tech, um, and quite a few of them are out there right now. So, um, we sp you talked about Mark Zuckerberg and, and Frank Warren in that one. The big news and the big headlines that y'all made this year, of course, were for Edward Snowden. Who, came, who didn't come, but who um, spoke to you guys. Can you tell us, how did you even get a hold of that guy? Uh, yes, Edward Snowden was, was one of our, well, probably our, our biggest buzz speaker from the 2014 event. I would love to be able to say that um, I, you know, dressed up in disguise and went to Moscow and met him at a coffee store or some dark alley or whatever, um, and we arranged for him to speak. Uh, actually, it was much, much, much easier than that in the sense that there was a third party that contacted us in, I think, November last year, said that they had access to Snowden and would we want him to speak at the 2014 event? And I said, yes, of course, we would. this would be a good thing for us. Ultimately, we are in the business of creating buzz, and this would create buzz. So the initial part, confirming him to speak, was pretty easy. Um, he wants to speak. We want him to speak. OK, it'll work out. Uh, <clears throat> what became a little more difficult was the various complications about announcing this. The third party that brought this to us didn't want us to announce it until we got closer to the event. The idea was that Snowden was getting bombarded for, by interview requests, and as soon as we announced this, that, that the number of requests would double or triple, and they didn't want that. Um, at our end, we wanted to figure out a strategy to, uh, to broadcast this thing, uh, but that, that was complicated because Snowden was at this time, or his people were negotiating with NBC and various other networks for the first live TV broadcast or live TV interview, or TV interview. And we didn't, and they didn't want it to be webcast broadcast by a network, which would then, you know, complicate those other negotiations. So we finally figured it out. We, uh, our friends at the Texas Tribune, um, did the webcast on that. That was uh, Snowden's people were fine with that. We did end up holding the announcement until about a week before the event. The other story here that's kind of fun, kind of interesting, whatever, is that about two weeks before the event, I had a call, or I had an email from a contact I'd made in the White House, um, and said, can we get on a phone call? And I said, sure. I figured that they were going to ask to get on a panel, and I was going to say, well, we're too late to to uh no white house you can't get on a south by southwest panel <laughs> well it was gonna be for a lower level person on a panel and we didn't that wasn't gonna work got on the call uh they said the president is interested underscore interested in the president is a big fan of south by southwest he's interested in making a south by southwest video is this something that you guys would want and I was, again Hell yeah, if the president wants to make a Welcome to South by Southwest video, we want this to happen. Um, okay, well, we'll take this back and, and we have to go through a series of meetings for this to happen and, and all kinds of bureaucratic processes, but knowing that you guys want it will help push this forward. Let's talk again in a week, okay? In the time between the first conversation and the second conversation, we announced the Snowden thing. The next time I got on the phone with them, well, the schedule has become a little bit busier next week. We can't. We can't do this. Now, I'm sure the Snowden thing had a huge impact on, uh, announcing that had a huge impact on the, the thing with POTUS not, not working. But if you also recall, um, March, early March was when Ukraine was first blowing up and the official line was 
it would not look presidential at this point for uh, Obama to be making some kind of South by Southwest video. So anyway, it was it was a fun story, interesting story. Um, I wish that had worked out. Maybe we can work something out in 2015. Um, the Snowden thing, uh, you know, whether you agree or disagree with our choice to give him a platform, I thought he was great um, because he, his message was not, woe is me, I'm stuck in prison in Moscow or, you know, virtual prison. His message was, we need to encrypt things better. Privacy is important. You guys are the geeks. Build systems that encrypt things better, that protects all of our privacy. And I thought that was a really good message. Further reinforced by the Instagram or the iCloud leaks this past week or two weeks ago, whenever that happened, of, of celebrity photos slightly less urgent than NSA secrets, but still. <laughs> well, how was yes, the, it's all connected, right? Yeah. <laughs> and how was the audience during the Snowden talk? I mean, did you have the same undercurrent of Twitter chatter amongst? visitors, and is that common now with all those uh, panels? Yeah, the, the audience, uh, we, we filled a big room. Um, we also had lots of people watching online, lots of people watching uh, around the, the, the world via the, the, the live stream. Um, I think that the audience back channel has become, in the, the five years since the Zuckerberg keynote that's become more of a uh, you know just more understood by everyone that that happens um, you know another interesting story off the Snowden thing was that um, we we'd gone through very complicated procedures on how you're gonna get how we're gonna connect with him in Moscow we tested the system all day the day before we tested the system for three hours in the morning before the session everything was fine Two minutes before the session starts, the connection goes down. <laughs> and no one could figure out why it went down. Like, what is going wrong? And then all of a sudden, it came back up. Um, Ooh. Very Somebody spooky, was crazy. watching. Um, and then it, the, the connection worked OK for the whole session. I think that it was actually easier to watch online than it was in person. Um, but uh, it was very. The talk was compelling. It was also this weird kind of Orwellian concept where you had this just this big head on the screen behind you, and he'd put the Constitution behind him. So it was kind of over the top. But um, again, no, it that's made, not over the top at all. It made for great theater, and ultimately, that's what we do at South by Southwest: is try to create theater and and enable people to make great deals and get their startups going. That too. <laughs> So what would your, so Snowden obviously was a big deal and a big coup this year. What would your, um, and we'll wrap it up in just a second and let people ask questions. What would your sort of fantasy person, is there somebody you, on your wish list who you'd love to have come to South by Southwest and do a session? Or will you speak to that? Well, the Snowden thing was great last year. Um, certainly, you know, the PRISM scandal broke in June and July. Um, we, taught, we had talked internally, could we get Snowden, and, and no, it doesn't look like it, and then it just kind of fell in our laps. Um, I don't know if there is something that is, uh, that is comparative in terms of weight for, the, for 2015. You know, some of the top names in the tech industry that we haven't had at the event before, um, a Jeff Bezos, would love to try to get him in. We had Elon Musk a couple of years ago, would love to get him back at the event. But I think it's also important to understand that, you know, it's great to have this reach to get these huge speakers in the event now. This is something relatively new. So much of what South by Southwest is, at its root, is getting speakers into the event that you've never heard of before, but you can say, you know, two or three years later, wow, I saw this, that guy in a small panel room when there was no one there, and look where he or she is now. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the heart of the event. There'll be 50 people at next year's event, 50 speakers that are, you know, big names that people have heard of. There will also be 1,200 speakers who never have heard of yet, but many of whom will go on to do incredible things, and that's where some of the real magic of the event occurs. Well, can you speak to next year at all? Do you know what the panels are going to be yet? 
Uh, we will do the bulk of our, we'll announce the bulk of our content on Monday, October 20th. We will announce uh, 12 more speakers this coming Monday, September 8th. Um, and uh, so we're, we're still at the very front end of uh, our content for the 2015 season. Some great stuff coming up that we're really excited about, but we're still a little bit preliminary there. And is the panel process still open? The panel picker voting process actually extends through Sunday night. Um, it is a great way to explore some of the most interesting ideas in this tech slash digital creative community. Uh, the URL there is panelpicker, sxsw.panelpicker.com. And again, you can go on and vote on these ideas, but uh, it's also, again, a great way to just scan what the tech industry and the creative industry is, is thinking about at this point. Well, thanks. Well, um, thank you again for coming out. It's been really great to talk to you and hear a little bit about what you all are up to. Do we have any questions from the audience? Does anyone have any questions or anything? I wanted to get, yes. We've got a mic coming here. Can you get a mic? Oh, that's right. We can't hear you. Oh, go ahead. Just talk. Go ahead, Emily. The question is really around this whole idea of launching a startup at an event, and you see it with Apple even with the next, the next iPhone. And so it's really sort of matured. I mean, you've talked a lot about this. How do you see the role of South by uh, strategically as you've got all these other really fun events popping up that may have different but similar audiences they're trying to reach, similar speakers? Uh, and again, a lot of this is just people copying what you guys have done and the success there. Uh, great question. I think that, or I know for us, uh, we have been to some degree a victim of our success, quote unquote, there in the sense that <clears throat> a lot of startups or tech companies are now very hesitant to launch at South by Southwest um, because there is such a big audience there and if you launch and fail, it's a kiss of death. Um, I think that, you know, if we go back to Twitter in 2007, I think what they did was really, or how it panned out for them was smart in the th sense that they'd launched four months earlier, they got some of the bugs out of the way, and then they came to South by Southwest and said, well, this is where we launched. And I mean, there's nothing that it has to be that they, you know, it, you, know you, you go live on the first day of South by Southwest. So I think that one of the challenges at our end is encouraging companies to, soft launch before and then you know do a the hard launch during the event itself um, we have seen in the past that companies get what they call a south by southwest bounce which is that they'll get 50 or 60,000 new users um, because they've launched at south by southwest and that's people at the event that's people who are following people at the event by twitter or facebook or whatever uh, and again, that can help a company out a lot, but if the company is getting 50 or 60,000 users and the functionality isn't there, that can hurt a company a lot. So again, we have been, uh, in many ways, the, the success of the event has hindered um, uh, more startups launching, and that's certainly a challenge and a concern for us going forward. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone? Yes. And, uh, there are people moving in different directions from NASA and, and one of my good friends is an astronaut and he recently retired and he's getting ready to go and with another company and where they're doing uh, making clothes from recycled bottles from this place in the ocean where it all accumulates and and so he's doing some other things that he's told me about that really isn't public but He's uh, now being asked to speak at various places. He just spoke at um, Apple, and he's heading to um, Australia. Is this somebody that you might be even interested in, in him, someone like that? I'm just imagine, you know, 
trying to, I'm listening to everything you're saying and I'm thinking of the conversations we've sure. had. I mean, geeks said oh, in the most positive way, love space, space travel. Uh, again, we had... Well, he was an NFL player and he got hurt and he had a degree in engineering. He's never been in the military. So he sort of got in sideways. But anyway, I was just curious yeah. and you're saying about the sciences and eco and he's all about those things and someone who's been in space and... Yeah, we had, uh, I mean, one of our, our, I mentioned that Elon Musk was at one of our keynotes in 2013. He's, of course, the uh, CEO of Tesla. Uh, you're welcome, Nevada. And um, also the founder of SpaceX. Uh, he gave a great keynote. We have certainly pushed a lot in this space direction in the last few years, whether it's NASA or whether it's various private space initiatives. Our crowd loves this stuff. Um, and this would be an interesting speaker to have involved. Well, Pharrell Williams loves him too. <laughs> Good. He's made a t-shirt with him. And Hugh Forrest loves to get pitched for panels all the time. That, that never happens to you, does it? Never. <laughs> um, any other questions, anyone? Oh, yes. I have one question. Um, so I guess that I, this conversation is fascinating. And for me, I come from a position of not um, like I'm part of a generation that should know a lot about technology, but doesn't and um, but or but I don't personally um, I'm interested in the way that with any type of innovation. There's always um, Responsibility about how one uses that technology and specifically things like um, Facebook and Twitter and the ways that we interact differently with that technology there are criticisms of it from um, writers such as Sherry Turkel and um, how does, does that thinking ever factor into any of the programming at South by Southwest? And if so, how? I mean, it's, and I asked from a completely objective perspective. Absolutely. I mean, we've tried to get Sherry to speak at the event several times before that it hasn't worked out. We've had a guy named Jared, Jaron Lanier speak who uh, has written a couple of, or has written a very influential book about um, the, the downfall of technology, you know, we are, I like to say that we are a big tent and that we uh, embrace diversity and that the more diverse opinions uh, we have, the stronger the event becomes. It's a marketplace of ideas. So I don't ever want Interactive to be completely pushing on uh, this idea that new technology makes for everything better. It definitely doesn't. I like it that we have people at the event who are questioning uh, new technology and and how that pushes forward. Uh, so this is something that's certainly important to us. I know that most of the people who speak at Interactive or participate in Interactive are of this belief that new technology can solve everything. But again, there should be checks and balances on that. And hopefully that's re reflected in the programming. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. that really you know, gave birth? The question is, would South by Southwest have been as successful uh, somewhere, other from, uh, somewhere else aside from Austin? I think that Austin is a huge, huge part of what we do. Um, Austin is a very, very creative city. And again, what we do is celebrate creativity. So uh, having Austin as our base has helped us a ton. We have tried to expand in other markets. Again, we're doing the event in Las Vegas. Previously, we did an event in Portland, Oregon. We did an event in St. Louis before, and have certainly found that as unique and interesting in their own right as those cities are, they are not quite as embracing of our vision of creativity as Austin is. What so, is it about Austin? I mean, what is... It's in the water. What's the magic? <laughs> uh, well, I think Austin... You know, you, it's a big university town, uh, less so now than, uh, or, or town with a big university, less so now in that the city has grown so much and the university isn't quite as much a part of it, but you always had this very strong music scene. Um, you still have a strong music scene. Uh, more, uh, a lot of, of tech people have come to Austin more recently. Uh, it's a city that embraces eccentricities. I mean, we have this saying, keep Austin weird, which came up 15 years ago. At that point, it was a kind of a, a uh, 
rallying cry between the development fact, uh, the pro-development and the no-development factions. I think that that saying has somewhat morphed over the years into keep Austin weird kind of means keep Austin creative. It's a saying now that the Chamber of Commerce, which I'm now a part of, uh, fully embraces. So I think at its heart, what is, what is magic, if you will, at times about Austin is this embrace of creativity. Again, there are challenges with the city as it continues to grow and, and, fast, and as quickly as it grows. Um, I think one of the things that spawned this creativity in Austin was it was traditionally a very cheap place to live. Um, as the city grows, it is no longer quite as, as uh, cheap to live as it was before. Rents are going higher, home prices are going higher. How does that change the dynamic of the city long term? And, and those are again the same challenges that we face at South by Southwest in that uh, our badge prices have, like it or not, increased a lot over the last few years. And are we pushing this younger, more creative demographic out of the market? These are big challenges moving forward. Thanks, everybody. Any, any last, one last question? Anyone know? All right. Well, Hugh Forrest, thank you again for coming to Houston, all the way down. Thank you for having me. And, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And just so you all know, uh, we've got two more glass tire talks. We're doing how to get rid of the art you don't want anymore later on today. And then tomorrow will be, in all seriousness, and then tomorrow is a talk about corporate collections. The corporate collection comment wasn't just a joke. So thank you all for coming out. Thanks again, Hugh, for coming down here. Thank you.